him. Hopefully that's why you're here. We're here to worship the name above all other name, and his name is Jesus Christ. Let's continue to worship him. Good morning. This is Pastor Les from Grace Bible Church, uh, West Dallas, Wisconsin. It's a joy to be with you today in unusual circumstances and situations. 
I'd like to uh, start out by praying. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Word of God. Thank you for allowing us to have the Bible. Thank you for the privilege we have to uh, focus on it. And God, that you would just use it in a very special way in the hearts and lives of those that hear. Thank you again for the privilege of being able to proclaim your word and the grace of God that has been given to us in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be uh, sharing this morning from the book of Second Chronicles, so if you want to turn there, chapter 20, we're going to take and uh, focus on a story that God has given to us and learn some spiritual lessons from it. Uh, the title of my message is The Power Is Out, and uh, I've chosen that uh, message title from Steve's uh, words as we were talking on the phone to set up this particular uh, special event for our lives. On Friday, the power went out intimately at our church and at our home, and uh, not only did it happen here, uh, it happened all around us. And uh, what we have heard from stories about trees down and uh, the sleet, the snow, the rain, and all that came with it uh, came and just uh, devastated our area in a way. And as a result of it, knocked down power lines. And as a result of it, uh, we've had to have homes without power uh, up three days right now and uh, maybe even into Monday. At this point in time, we've been blessed to have a generator, and uh, God has allowed the board and our church to provide one for us here at the Parsonage. And uh, trust that uh, some of you have that ability to have that freedom of having a generator, and we're thankful to God for it. By Friday evening, uh, the generator was going continuously, and the snow was very thick on the trees and on the limbs, and as a result, they were falling down right in front of our house as well as in the back. And uh, in fact, uh, one fell down right near our house and uh, looked up in the tree and saw where it uh, came from. Uh, that evening, Friday, uh, we had a call from a friend of ours and asked if he could come over. He couldn't get into his garage because when he pushed the button, the door didn't open. And as a result, uh, he was left outside of the house. And so he came over here, uh, spent the night, and uh, was on his way the next morning. Uh, uh, as I worked with the snowblower uh, on that day, uh, at the end of my uh, procedure of trying to blow the snow out of our driveway and around the area here, uh, the two auger pins broke and uh, basically were sheared and as a result of it had to put that into the garage and uh, wait for the next day to do anything with it. On Saturday my wife ran around looking for uh, parts as well as some tools to be able to fix it and we did some shoveling. My grandson and my son came over. We did some shoveling and removal of snow and then after that, we worked for about three hours on taking two shear pins out and trying to uh, repair it. And thankfully, uh, we were able to do that. I sent an email out uh, notifying the church of the closing uh, on Sunday, which is right now. Uh, Steve called and uh, said, why don't you? And he sort of left it wide open as to what I should do about getting a message ready for you. So uh, from uh, that call until uh, this point in time, I've been putting together a message that I hope will be a blessing to you. On uh, midnight of uh, Sunday morning about that time, uh, our generator quit running. And of course, I know nothing about generators or anything else, and I called uh, place about 3 a.m., which I woke up at that point in time, it was a little chilly, and tried to uh, find out uh, who I could call to try to have them come or give me some wisdom. So I called and uh, I got the operator, but that's as far as my phone call went. And so as a result of it, uh, we have our fireplace here, our new insert, and uh, we're thankful for that. And as a result of that, 
we, uh, I kept the fire going. The problem was that I had to cure the paint on it, and so I had to let leave the fire door open, and it smoked up the room, and every five minutes the smoke alarm went off, and uh, it was an interesting night without much rest. But anyway, about, uh, I'm saying probably uh, 7.30 in the morning, I decided to venture out and just open up the generator, push some buttons, and it turned on, and so we have heat back in the house again, and we're thankful for that. I uh, started to work on this message at 9.30. I got done at 10 o'clock, and so here's what uh, you're going to get. So, you know, as I look at the whole situation in our area, Milwaukee, uh, West Dallas, and the surrounding suburbs, um, uh, many have lost a lot of power. 60,000, 100,000 homes are without it. No heat, no lights, no microwave ovens. <clears throat> A lot of things that uh, we take for granted. And of course, my wife and I realized on Sunday morning that uh, we had no power and no heat and no lights. And as a result, it allowed us to identify with many of you that have been without. And so we're thankful to God for uh, getting our power back so quickly. But I want to turn to the <clears throat> book of Second Chronicles, chapter 20. And uh, talk about a story that the power is out. And I'm going to just go right into the focus statement and uh, have you think about Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a king of Israel, the king of Judah, the southern kingdom actually. And Jehoshaphat was what we would call a good king. Uh, throughout the Word of God, as you look through the Old Testament, you will find that Israel, the northern kingdom, and the southern kingdom both had 19 kings. And it's interesting that the northern kingdom uh, started out bad, and all 19 kings were bad. And that's a sad report of that uh, kingdom. The southern kingdom had good and bad, good and bad, and, and it seemed to change hands. And uh, interesting that sometimes there was a bad king, and all of a sudden, out of the lineage of that king uh, comes a good king, and uh, God bless that nation. So Judah, the southern kingdom, is the focus in this chapter. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to have my wife get me some water if she's around, and uh, I'd like to clear my throat for you. So anyway, Second Chronicles chapter 20. My focus statement is Jehoshaphat found God's power when he and his nation had no power at all. And so as a result of it, um, we're going to find that uh, we have a kingdom that has no power. We have a king that has no power. And uh, we have a God that has great power. Yeah, thank you for the water. Hopefully it will help. Anyway, uh, I'm really taking this message and given two points to it. The first one is very simple. The multitude were coming. And what it reads in verses 1 and 2, After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and with them some of the Menunites, uh, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. And as they came... Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea. And behold, they are in Hezer, Hezazon, Tamar, that is, En Gedi. And so there were these millions of men, soldiers, coming towards Jerusalem. And as a result of it, we find that Jehoshaphat is now informed about that. The first thing we find about uh, Jehoshaphat is in verse 3. It says, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid. Typical thing when you've got millions of people coming against you, an army, and uh, you don't have that big of an army, and that's what Jehoshaphat had. 
And it says here that he became afraid. You know, it's, it's okay to be afraid. Nothing wrong with fear. Fear is a natural emotional response in life. And it's not a sinful thing to have the emotional fear uh, that we may have about situations that we have in life or uh, circumstances that God, God brings our way. But this is the beautiful thing about it. It says, Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So there's this great swelling up of desire to talk to God, to seek his face, to find out what he wanted. And uh, as a result of it, I believe that the fear of Jehoshaphat reduced. That is, when we have a focus in our life, especially upon the Lord Jesus Christ, that God takes away that fear. And I think that's exactly what happened here. And it's interesting that uh, we find Jehoshaphat praying in the very next verse. Verse 5, And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord before the new court, and said, O Lord God, of our fathers. Are, not, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. Now, listen to the words of what Jehoshaphat is praying, what he's saying. It tells you the intensity of his heart, his love for the Lord, and his desire to please God. And he realizes that he is in trouble. His nation is in trouble. His city is in trouble. And he realizes that the enemy that's coming is far greater than his army. And the Bible says here that he tells God that he knows who rules the nations. He, he knows who, who has control of this world. And as a result of it, he goes into the fact that he says, because you rule and re realize that you have power and might, that there's none able to withstand you, I think that gave him peace in this particular time. <clears throat> I'd like to go on. Verse 7. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people, Israel, and gave it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? So what Jehoshaphat now is going to, and as the people of Israel are listening to him, He's talking about the past history of Israel, talking about how they uh, were freed, how they were uh, just a, a particular people that God just uh, poured his grace and his mercy out upon, but also that he also drove out the inhabitants of Canaan. And as a result, that's where the Israelites were to be. And it says here, and they have lived in it, that is that, nation and have built for you a sanctuary for your name and you know that one that Solomon built the temple and that's where it is right at that time and it's saying if disaster comes upon us the sword the judgment or pestilence or famine we will stand before this house and before you for your name is in this house and cry out to you in affliction and you will hear and save <clears throat> so the promise is given by God that if you uh, have a need in your life, what you need to do is to turn your face towards Jerusalem, put your face uh, towards the temple, and God will hear your prayers. That's exactly what Jonah did inside of the big fish. That's what many of the people of the past of Israelites did when distress and problems came their way. And as a result of it, uh, this is what Jehoshaphat is doing. They're right in Jerusalem, they're facing the temple, and they're praying. And this is what Jehoshaphat does. <clears throat> Verse 10. And now behold, the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let invade, Israel invade, when they came into the land of Egypt, from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy. Behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession 
which you have given to inherit for the Israelites to inherit. And so here they are. They're uh, just putting their, themselves into the hand of God and allowing him to take and uh, protect them. And so in the history, it says, you know, you didn't allow us to go and destroy their nations, but you allowed them to live. And now they've come back here to take away your possession, and that is the nation of Israel. Verse 12, O our God, will you not execute judgment on them? Notice these next few words. For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. Notice that? The power has gone out. Israel is without power. The nation's armies are not enough to fight against the enemy. They are powerless. And this is exactly where uh, Jehoshaphat really is wise in his choice of words. Nothing wrong with being powerless. But notice the next sentence. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Wow. When we get into trouble, Jehoshaphat knew where to go. And that was to go to take and turn to God, to seek his face and to find out from him what does he want. And so, as a result of it, God responds to that prayer. Listen in verse 13. Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazadiel, and he was the prophet of God. And he said in verse 15, Listen, all Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, and King Jehoshaphat, this is what God says to you. Do not be afraid. And do not be dismayed by this great horde. Don't be concerned about this big number of soldiers that are coming. For listen to the next words. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Isn't that wonderful? To know that God goes before us, that he takes care of our problems and goes before us in whatever situation we're in. And Jehoshaphat is hearing these words and he's listening to what God is saying. And he is excited, he's thrilled about it. And as a result of it, his fear now is gone. Notice what the prophet continues. Tomorrow, go down against them. <clears throat> that is the people of Judah and Jehoshaphat. Ah, get some more water. <clears throat> Tomorrow, <clears throat> go down against them. Behold, they will come up against the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jerusalem. You will not need to fight in this battle. Don't have to go up there with swords. Don't have to go up there in battle and fight. Stand firm. Hold your position and watch the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them and the Lord will be with you. God is going to be with this nation, this small nation, going to be with this king, this faithful king. And when they go out to battle the next day, they won't have to be concerned. They can relax. They don't have to take their swords, their spears, and all their armor. Just relax in the Lord. And so we find this response that God gives through the prophet. <clears throat> I'm going to just stop and have you think with me. Have afflictions in your life? Have problems? Have difficulties in your life? Turn to the Lord. Realize your situation. Realize the fact that you have no power. Just as we got up <clears throat> this morning, we realized we had no power. We had no electricity. Generator wasn't running. We were in the same state that people that had no electricity 
in their homes had for a time. And we had to come to God. Jehoshaphat came with a humble heart. We need to come to God with a humble heart. We need to recognize his power. We need to recognize his grace and mercy, his care for us. And we need to come to him with a humble heart and talk to him and share with him. We need to focus our eyes on Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I'd like to give you two verses that are in the book of Isaiah chapter 26 that may be of help to you. I'm going to take and get some water here. <clears throat> sort of nice preaching from my house. Uh, verses 3 and 4, Isaiah 26. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. God keeps our hearts in perfect peace when our eyes are focused on him, when our spirits are focused on him. Notice what it says in verse 4. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. I like that. I like that rock. I like that solid foundation. And God, Christ, is my rock. And I can go to him at any time. I need to trust in that rock. I need to trust in him forever, every day. I need him because I'm powerless. But I want to get, include verse 9. My soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly seeks you. You know, one of the hardest times that we have in life usually is at night time when it's dark when we have no light no heat and as a result of it we need to turn to him so seek the lord let god do his work in your life just as he did with us regarding the uh, generator god did it it's not me i pushed a few buttons it went and god did that work and you know, he does not need our help, does he? He doesn't need your help to solve your problems. What he needs is you to turn to him and humbly ask him for help, and he will do it. Well, I want to go on to the solution. What, what came of this whole matter? <clears throat> I'm going to jump down to verse 20. They rose up early in the morning. They went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to his words now, Hear me, Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will succeed. Hear what he's saying? Number one, to believe in the Lord himself, the person of the Lord, Jehovah God. Believe in him, number one. Number two, be established. Don't change your mind. Don't switch. Simply focus on God. Number three, believe his prophets. One of the prophets just spoke and told them what to do. That this is not your battle. You're not going to have to fight. Believe it. And then you will succeed. And that's the final thing. Success is really what we look forward to in life. Now listen to verse 21 as he talks in this passage about what he does in preparation for the battle. Verse 21 says, And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in the holy attire, as they went before the army and say, Give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. That was the battle. That was the fight. That was the armor. That was the weapons that were used in this battle. Sing, praise, worship. I know this is a, an unusual situation, but you know, God does things in our unusual situations as well in our lives. In verse 22 it says, And when they began to sing and to praise, and the Lord set an ambush against the men of the Ammonites, the Moabites, and of Mount Seir who had come against Judah. God did it. 
God was setting an ambush. And it says in verse 23, For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting themselves to destruction. And when they made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. So, God had a spirit of destruction in those men that were part of this army, and they destroyed one another. There was not one sword, there was not one spear thrown, there was not one of the enemy that was destroyed by Judah or Jerusalem. All they did was sing, and God delivered them. What a powerful message. Again, we have that God gives us the results. God gives us the answers, and he gives us success in life. And I'll just read the rest of it here real quickly. Verse 24, When Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked toward the horde. Behold, there were dead bodies lying on the ground. Get this next phrase. None had escaped. Every one of the soldiers had been wounded and eventually died, and none had been escaping. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found among them, the, in great numbers, goods, clothing, and precious things. And they took them away, day after day after day. Three days' worth, and they were taking away all of these things. They returned to Jerusalem in verse 27, and it says they had returned with great joy, for the joy, the, excuse me, for the Lord had given them rejoice over their enemies. You see, God provided the victory in this battle. They didn't have to fight as God had promised. And it says in verse 29, and the fear of the Lord came uh, to all of the kingdoms of the countries. And verse 30, and God gave them rest. So God was in charge of this whole battle. He was in charge of the lives. And God is in charge of our lives right now. Whatever's happening in your life, and you may have some very, very challenging things happening. I'm going to sit back because I don't have to read scripture anymore. But I want you to realize that God has a special plan for the challenges that you have in your life. And you have to be trusting him in those battles, in those afflictions, whatever it may be. I want to say this. Jesus Christ came into this world to be God's solution of going to heaven and having eternal life. I want you to understand, you cannot do anything to help God to get to heaven, to have eternal life. Your eternal life depends upon God and what he did. And what he did was to send his only son, Jesus Christ, into this world to die for the sins of mankind. And we need to humble ourselves to realize that we are sinners. We need to humble ourselves and realize that Jesus Christ is the only way to go to heaven. That we must put our faith and we must put our trust in what he did for us on the cross. He died, he shed his blood, he gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins. But not only that, but he was buried and he arose again three days later to prove that he was God, that he was God in flesh, and that this God-man died and died for us and for our sins, that we might have eternal life. When we go to the Lord and we talk to him and share with him that we're sinners and we tell him, that we want to trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, God does the work. God will do it in you. He's done it in those who have trusted Christ as Savior in our church and in our world. And it's up to you. If you've never trusted Christ as your personal Savior, now is the day, now is the time to place your trust in Him, that you may know that you have eternal life. Just simply pray this prayer and mean it with all of your heart. You can follow me. I will lead you in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I am a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed his blood for my sins. I want to place my trust in him as my Savior. 
now and forever. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, and you really meant it with all of your heart, God saved you forever. And this is a wonderful thing. I trust that you will have a great day, wherever you are, what's ever happening. And if there are afflictions and problems and struggles in your life, that you'll turn to Him, you'll turn and search for Him, that God would help you through them. Let's pray as we close out today. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Lord, you've been with me all these 58 years of life as a Christian, and you've been watching and caring and helping me through multitudes of struggles and times. Father, I pray that you might be with those that are going through difficult times, that you might watch over them, that they may turn their eyes towards you. And for those that have listened and learn to trust Jesus Christ as Savior. May you just be with them in a very special way. Thank you for allowing us to look at Second Chronicles 20. Glorify yourself as we continue to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if uh, you looked at the fireplace yet, Steve, but uh, we have a new insert that uh, we had put in this past week, and uh, we have been blessed to be able to have a fire in it now and warm up this uh, sunken living room, as we call it, and this is where I'm at this morning, and uh, enjoying the fruit of uh, what you, the people, have allowed us to have, a new fireplace. The old one was 1978, and so it'll be a refreshing time to be able to use this fireplace for the glory of God in our lives. Thank you very much for being a part of that. May you have a great day and a good week. God bless you.